Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I am your host, Chris Broussard. We've got a great show for you today. We check in with the interview with Howard Beck, longtime NBA writer from Bleacher Report. He gives us some great insight on the NBA playoffs and a few other matters going on around the association. But first, as always, we're going to hit you with a top five. And remember, throughout the playoffs, we are doing the top five postseason player power rankings. So checking in at number five, none other than the best player on the planet, LeBron James. Do not blame LeBron for the Cavaliers being in a 2-2 dog fight with the lowly Indiana Pacers. He is doing it all. He's been phenomenal. He leads the Cavs in scoring 32 points a game, rebounding 12 boards a game, assist eight a game, even blocks won a game, all while shooting 54% from the floor. But everybody needs at least a little bit of help. Here's how little bit of help LeBron is getting. All four of the guys that started with him in game four, every single one of them is shooting below 40% from the field in this series. Kevin Love, supposed to be his number two, now that Kyrie Irving has gone, 12 points a game in the series. LeBron needs some help, but I'm not going to punish him individually. He's at number five. At number four, Ben Simmons. Some call him LeBron James' protege, but he is not playing like anyone's protege right now. He is taking the NBA by storm. In his first playoff series, he darn near averaged a triple-double to lead the Sixers to a 4-1 series victory over the Miami Heat. 18 points a game, 10.6 rebounds a game, a team high. That's right, Simmons led him in rebounding, not Joel Embiid, and also threw in nine assists a game, shot 50% from the floor. And just to let you know, he gets it done on both sides, a team high, 2.4 steals per game. With Ben Simmons running the show, Everybody in Philadelphia gets to eat. Six players averaging double figures in the series, including five who scored more than 16 points a game. At number three, Drew Holiday. He teamed up with Rajon Rondo to outplay one of the best backcourts in the league in Portland's Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum in the New Orleans Pelicans sweep of the third-seeded Blazers in the closeout game, which many people say is the hardest game of a series. He put up 41 points, eight assists, and for the series shot 57% from the floor. He also showed you that he is one of the best defensive guards in the league. He put the handcuffs on Damian Lillard. After Lillard had this tremendous regular season, Drew Holiday held him to 25 percent shooting in the 150 possessions that he defended Lillard during the series. At number two, rookie Donovan Mitchell. He is straight balling. All he's doing is outplaying an MVP and two other veteran stars in the Jazz's series with the Oklahoma City Thunder. With no other teammate virtually who can create his own shot, Mitchell is averaging 27 points a game and also for good measure eight and a half rebounds a game in game four he bested Carl the mailman Malone's rookie franchise record for points in a game by 33 points in a playoff game that total made him just the third rookie in the last 50 years to score at least 110 points in the first four playoff games of his career. The other two, Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Anytime you put yourself in that kind of company, you know you're getting love from in the zone. And at number one, for the second straight week, Anthony the Brow Davis. How can he not be number one? I mean, he's leading all scores in the playoffs with 33 points a game. In their sweep of the Portland Trail Blazers, he averaged 12 rebounds a game, shot 57% from the field, made nearly two steals a game, blocked 
Nearly three shots a game. I mean, he did it all. He is the number one reason that the Portland Trailblazers have prematurely gone fishing, shopping, sunbathing, whatever they're doing now. They're no longer playing basketball, and Anthony Davis is the main reason why. That is why he's number one on this week's top five postseason player power rankings. All right, I want to welcome into In the Zone a good friend of mine, longtime colleague, Howard Beck. He's a senior NBA writer at Bleacher Report. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at, at Howard Beck. Uh, and he's also the host of the Full 48 podcast. It's an honor to have you on, Howard. How are you doing today? Uh, honor to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm great. Great, great, great. Well, let's get right to it. It's a, tons of NBA stuff going on, obviously. Uh, first, I'm, you're based in New York, so I want to ask you, the Knicks obviously are going through a coaching search. Um, they you know, fired Jeff Hornacek after the season, and uh, some of the candidates, Mark Jackson, David Fisdale, David Black, you know, it, it, it seems to be expanding um, by the day. But I want to ask you this first, because I, I jokingly, although it really is true, I, I kind of feel <laughs> – I jokingly refer to the Knicks as the place that legends go to die because, you know, they fired Isaiah Thomas, who obviously was a legend, Lenny Wilkins, Larry Brown, Phil Jackson. And for all of those great basketball minds and figures, it's ended ugly in New York. Uh, You were there for a lot of those, um, if not even all of them. Um, What do you think? Yeah, okay, all of them. Okay, so you know, like (laughs) – what do you think has been the problem there? Why none of these great basketball men have been able to succeed there? Well, and by the way, you could add Mike D'Antoni, who of course now is a genius yes, again now that he's in Houston. Where thank he you. Was, he was an idiot. He was, D'Antoni was an idiot in New York. He's a genius again in Houston. I don't know. What <laughs> he learned. He learned That's a lot right. of basketball and learned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more about basketball in the last five years. Clearly, right. right. Um, Don, Don, Donnie Walsh left here under a cloud. Um, you know, it's yeah. And Donnie we, had probably one of the more successful tenures, right, of of those guys we named in New York. He he did right, and he left anyway because of the aggravation, yeah. and you know, just didn't want to put up with it anymore. I mean, listen, the, every question about Nick's instability, and and that is the, in their DNA now. Instability, whether it's the front office, coaching staff, roster, that instability is part of the Madison Square Garden's culture. And that stuff always goes to the top. It goes to the owner. It goes to Jim Dolan. And this is, this is his legacy. This is what he has created, an environment where even the best in the business, as coaches, as GMs, have a hard time succeeding here. Now, there are some details that are important, of course, along the way. Phil Jackson was probably never the best idea to hire as a team president in the first place, a job he'd never done before. But still, that things end badly here for legends of, of all stripes – um, you know, it, it doesn't happen that way over and over and over again if there isn't something wrong with the organization itself. And of course, there's something wrong with this organization. Um, so, you know, Dolan, to his pseudo credit, when he hired Phil, said, I'm going to do this and get out of the way. I have concluded I am not good at basketball, which was the right thing for him to say. And it was probably a line that was fed to him by somebody else. But he, from everything I gather, he pretty much stuck to that, and he, he, he held to his promise to not interfere, um, but he probably placed his faith in the wrong person. And I say that as somebody who has great respect for Phil Jackson and like him a lot, and obviously I covered him for five years in L.A., um, but I don't think that that, you know, when you finally decided uh, as the owner to take a hands-off approach, you, you should have put it in the hands of, the franchise in the hands of somebody who was really, uh, not just capable and, and a smart basketball mind, but somebody who had the experience of running a front office and Phil Jackson didn't have that. So um, call that whatever it is. The fact is you still end up having to turn around and chase off another big name. And, you know, he, you know, elevates Steve Mills who has been with the garden in one capacity or another for most of the last two decades through all of this yep. instability. And then he hires Scott Perry. So now you've got a, a new ish, uh, front office, but I mean, the jury's still out on, on, on that. Um, I don't know, you know, it's hard to know where they're heading. Now they're going to, that, that, that twosome, you know, Mills and, and, uh, and Perry will, will pick their head coach. 
So we'll know more soon about what their ideas are, presumably, and what the kind of direction they're, they're choosing. But yeah, listen, if, if things go badly again, you know, Porzingis is out for most of next season and, you know, Neil Aquino doesn't take a big step and, you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. doesn't keep uh, growing. Um, if nothing changes, you know, two years from now, you and I could be having the same conversation. And they'll have fired Steve Mills and Scott Perry and whatever coach they've hired will be gone too. And we'll be doing this whole cycle all over again. And listen, that's part of pro sports. Coaches, GMs are hired to be fired, but you should get a longer life cycle out of them. You know, you, you could at least yeah, up those yeah. averages, you know, <laughs> get seven or eight, seven or eight years out of a front office and four or five years out of a coach <laughs> instead of like two years. That would yes, be improved. Yes. Well, that, that's what, before I ask you who you think would be the best man for the job, does it matter? I mean, cause I, they, it's not a great job as constituted and you know, Porzingis, it looks like he could be out for most of the next season. if not all. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, when you ask, is it, a, is it a good job or what kind of coach fits, it almost doesn't make a difference to me because this is not a team that's designed to win right now. It's still a roster that has a lot of holes, and the most important player, Porzingis, is missing at least half of next season and potentially all of it. I mean, it, it, you know, none of us can know that, right? Every ACL yeah. surgery, every ACL recovery is a little different. Um, and, you know, he is 7'3". I mean, this is not the average – like which is one thing when like a six two guy tears his ACL and gets it repaired, the kind of pressure and torque and strain that a guy at seven three who moves like Porzingis does, that's a different kind of stress on the knee. So maybe you're going to take a more cautious approach, and maybe that's the wise thing to do with him heading toward free agency next a uh, year from from the summer. So um, yeah. it, it, it's hard to know. And so yeah, it's probably another lost season. I mean, I don't think that's even a stretch to say that without your franchise star for, for most or all of the season and with nobody else to really build around, I, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a, a team designed to, to make much progress. And so when it comes to the coach, listen, I guess the, the, the right answer is a coach who is a teacher first, who's a development guy, because it's, you know, you've got some key young pieces, whether it's Porzingis and Neela Kina, um, the draft pick that they're going to get in June, uh, currently what ninth, I think. Um, you're you're gonna have you know it's a developmental group. You know they've got some veterans hanging out, but I think your best bet is to try to offload those guys, which they should have been doing anyway, and keep going young because you just need to build a group that's going to grow around Porzingis. And you know now who who fits that bill? I'm not sure. Um, I'm uh, it, it's. You know, there are, there are some pros and cons to all these guys. But as I say, I, I know, I'm not sure it matters who the coach is for at least the next year or two. Yeah, no, it, that's a good point. I thought Mark Jackson would be a good fit. Obviously, the New York ties, but he was good with Golden State as a young team to get instill confidence and defensive mentality and all that. I, I'm under the impression he's been blackballed. Is that – do you tend to agree with that? Or – and I don't mean an official conspiracy, but – you know, his name has kind of been sullied out there, and this might be one of the few jobs he, he could actually get. Yeah, I saw that you had tweeted that the other day. I cringed a little, to be honest, because um, it's, it's, a, it's a strong term. Um, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't view it as Mark Jackson being blackballed. I do think there's skepticism out there about him, whether people believe that's justified or not. Um, you know, there was, there was a messy ending in Golden State. You know, they didn't fire him just because they lost – you know, in the what was it? That was yeah. the first round series to the to the Clippers, right? It wasn't about Clippers. that. They won fifty something games. Yeah, that was a breakthrough season in terms of their win total, first fifty win season, and, and forever. So it wasn't about the results. It was about relationships, both with his his staff, with other people in the organization. Um, and look, it's certainly fair too to say that yes, that was a young team that he developed, that he instilled a, a, a especially the defensive end a tremendous discipline in. And, and they became a 50-win team under his guidance. But their offense was average, and they had two of the greatest shooters, as, as he was the first to note, possibly the best shooting yep. backcourt in history. He was absolutely right about that, and I, I think a lot of people <laughs> scoffed when they first heard him say it. He was right, but he didn't deploy them well. His offensive schemes were too simplistic. They were very heavily reliant on, on isolation play. Um, you know, Steve Kerr brought a more dynamic offense. Now, would that offense yep. have – bloomed under under 
Mark Jackson anyway? We'll never know. But I, I think that people are judging him on the results. I think that, that the relationships um, and the things that people have heard and that have been reported probably hurt him a little bit. Uh, I think he's gotten, I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, I, 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 hasn't he gotten into a couple interviews over the last couple of years? I thought he's at least interviewed for a job or two. He may have, I mean, not many. I don't know exactly if he's had interviews. Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. I think maybe one uh, or two, but um, obviously, yeah, he hasn't hadn't gotten any of those jobs. But, but yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, Kurt took them to a whole other level, you know, and, and, you know, that as well as some of the other uh, issues could definitely be hurting him. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see who they go with uh, in New York. Now, I want to move I'm, on to – oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, quick thought. I do think that it, he would be an interesting choice for New York for some of the reasons that you kind of alluded to. They, if you're not going to win for the next couple of years, get a coach who is a strong leader who can not only raise up the young guys, but also it's important in New York to have a coach who has a certain uh, presence and who communicates yeah. well with the media and who resonates with the fans. So if you're going to be losing anyway, it would be good to have a, a good personality in that spot where – you know, whether well, it's good coach, bad coach, average coach, whatever, he's a representative of the team. He puts a different face on the team that fans, I think, would uh, would, would respond to. So it, it at least it's, it's a little bit of goodwill and a connection to the fans that has a value of its own. And that's not to say that his coaching doesn't have a value. It's just that in New York you have to consider these other things too, especially if we're if, if they're continuing to go through a period here that's going to be a little rough on the court. It, it certainly would help help to have a good ambassador of the club and one who already has a, has New York credibility um, yep. standing there in front of the cameras every day. So, so I, it, there's a lot to say for that. I do want to get into some playoff talk, but I, I want to ask you before that another, you know, you mentioned some dysfunction and some issues going on with, when Mark Jackson was in golden state relationships, how surprised are you to see the way this situation in San Antonio with Kawhi Leonard and the Spurs have developed and where do you think, you know, how do you think it ends up? I mean, a lot of people around the league think he'll get traded this summer. Um, others think the Spurs will still offer him that super max and try to work it out. What, where do you stand on the surprise factor and then on how it ends up? I mean, I have, I have misread this situation from the start. I got to say, like I, if you had asked me a month ago, two months ago, four months ago, I would have said um, there's, there's no way he's still out in the playoffs. He's going to be playing in the playoffs. He'll be back in the playoffs. I would have thought that absolutely. I'm, I'm stunned that he's not. Um, now, is that because of injury that, continue, that, that truly still needs rehabilitation? Is that because of s- some mental block? Is that because of some rift with the organization? Is it all of the above? I don't think we know, which, you know, hey, typical of the Spurs, we, we, we know as little as, as possible. Um, yep. I still have a hard time believing as great as that organization has been and remains that they won't find a way forward here, that not just the 200 million that's eligible, that's on the table for, for Kawhi Leonard and an extension, but just the fact that, you know, this is an organization that in general is going to do things right, is going to make the smart moves. Once you can get guys in a room and and talk this out and discuss whatever the differences of opinion are about the injury or the, the treatment, the rehab, Whatever. I, I got to feel like it, because it's in everybody's best interest. It's, I think it's in Kawhi Leonard's best interest to resolve this and stay there. I said, it's obviously in the Spurs best interest. Um, so yeah, look, uh, after all this time, I think we all should probably still have faith that the Spurs uh, will figure out a way to resolve what is clearly a very unusual drama for them. Do, do you, um, you know, a lot of teams, we've, we've reportedly the Clippers are going to put together a trade package for him. I, I think Boston will try to do that. And even, I mean, they certainly have the pieces to probably put together the best or certainly one of the best offers. If you were running Boston, would you put Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum in a deal for Kawhi or would you kind of stand pat? Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky one, right? I mean, look, look at how great those guys are playing, and they're still so young. They, they have the potential to, you know, be, you know, both of them to be perennial all-stars, but could they be as impactful as Kawhi? I mean, Kawhi was an MVP candidate a year ago. 
And Kawhi, yeah. you know, at, at, at you know when he was healthy, was one of the best two way players in the NBA. He's built for today's NBA. Um, ordinarily, I would say you 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 take the you know I, I guess the bird in hand is the one who's not actually in hand in this case. The, the analogy is all screwed up. But the <laughs> but I would I, I want the established all star, not the guy who might become an all star, right? Um, as long as he's still in his prime, and Kawhi Leonard is. So ordinarily, I would say. Yeah, go ahead and flip the young guy with the potential for the guy who already has that potential realized and who you can get several more years out of and who might accelerate your ability to become a a true championship contender because you put Kawhi Leonard uh, at full strength with Kyrie Irving, Al Horford, and whichever of the two young guys that you kept and the rest of that crew, plus they've still got more picks because they always have more picks. Um, You're going to have to you're in great shape to contend, right? And maybe you get a leg up on Philly because they're, they're coming fast too. But here's the concern. Um, what is the physical part? Is, is Kawhi right? If he's not right yet, why isn't he right yet? And is, you know, is he going to get back to, to the old Kawhi? Two, this does kind of feel like there's something else going on, right? Like whether it's him or the advisors around him, um, or if it's psychological, the way it kind of was with Derek Rose coming back from his knee years ago, then you start to worry about mindset and, you know, what, that's are what you acquiring a quiet? Yeah. yeah. Does that, like, does that are make you, him maybe less valuable to, you know what I mean? Teams question, is that the guy we can count on? You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. That would give me pause. That would absolutely give me pause. Now, that's why you do your due diligence. And of course, Danny Ainge is as, as skilled at this as anyone. He, you know, he, he and I, I would assume no other GM would make a deal for Kawhi Leonard that costs you, you know, great prospects and picks and everything else, unless you have determined for certain that he's fine mentally, physically, emotionally, and otherwise. But right now, I think there's good reason for people to wonder about his, his mindset and so those are the things you have to resolve before you give up anything of great value. And the Celtics, look, you always, you always love the guys you have, right? If you're a Celtics fan or if you're Celtics officials and coaches, I think it's really hard to give up the young guys that you think could grow into superstars that you drafted, who are you, you've already got the emotional and, and actual investment in, and you'd rather see those guys. And it's like, I don't want to trade them for anything. Well, if it's the old Kawhi Leonard, the guy who was MVP of the finals a few years ago, yeah, it's worth sacrificing one of those young guys. But if it's anything less than that, you, you just, you, you know, you probably can't. Yeah. So um, that that's an interesting quandary for all these teams that are going to be poking around about Kawhi Leonard is how much do you give up given what's gone on for the last eight months? Let's stay in, we're in the, well, I guess we've been in the East and the West with Boston and Kawhi. <laughs> right, let's, let's stay in the East. Um, Cleveland, you know, obviously struggling a bit with Indiana in their first round series. Do you, you know, LeBron is always the guy, the lightning rod, and and he'll get criticism uh, if the team loses. Some people put it all on the supporting cast. Some people put it all on LeBron. How do you read this? Is this the struggles they're having? Is it more just he doesn't have the help? Is it he is aging a bit, even though his numbers are still huge? Um, what do you think, um, you know, we, we're learning about LeBron right now or learning about the Cavs right now? I've felt from the beginning this season, and I wrote this back in November when they were five and seven or whatever it was, and it was before they had their first big turnaround when they won a bunch of games in December against a really soft schedule. But I wrote back then, and I've been saying ever since, before the trades and after the trades, this is the worst supporting cast LeBron has had since he left Cleveland the first time in 2010. And it's true. It's, this is not this group, whether it was the Derek Rose, Isaiah Thomas, Dwayne Wade, Iman Shumpert, Channing Fry group that they shipped out, or whether this new group with Rodney Hood, Jordan Clarkson, uh, and the rest. Either way, this is not as good as the Cavs team that they had the last few years because you don't have Kyrie Irving. And yep. some of the guys who were left over from those years aren't as good as they were. Tristan Thompson's not the same guy. Jared Smith's not the same guy. Shumpert, before you shipped him out, wasn't the same guy. They're, not, they're just nowhere near as good as they were the last three years in Cleveland, and they're certainly nowhere near as good as those Miami Heat teams were with a still in his prime Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh and the great supporting cast that they had there. So th- this just isn't a very good team overall. Um, and that 
everything always goes back to LeBron is just, it, it's such a dumb, tired trope. And I know that like that this is how we as fans and media talk about the NBA in general, it's never um, about, you know, can the Celtics win? It's going to be, can Kyrie win with the Celtics? And it'll always yeah. be a referendum on, on his move. And, you know, it's never, you know, right now it's not about the thunder. It's about Russell Westbrook. Uh, I mean, that's, that is how we talk about the NBA because superstars define the narrative and, and they're the ones who drive the conversation. But i the reason I always defended LeBron's decision back in 2010 to leave Cleveland for Miami was because it's a very simple truth about the NBA. Nobody wins a championship on their own. Even the best players in history don't win it on their own. Magic and Kareem needed each other, Pippen and, and Jordan, Shaq and Kobe, on and on and on. And so if you can't get stars to Cleveland, then LeBron going and finding his own star teammates was fully justified in my opinion. And, and he's been vindicated as far as I'm concerned as well. And it's the same reason why I understood why he left Miami for Cleveland and, and went back because that heat team was starting to erode. So right now what he has is a, a very, very good Kevin love. Kevin loves an all-star and a legitimate all-star, but he's not at that same level of all-star or that same level of, of, of offensive dynamism as Kyrie Irving, as Dwayne Wade was, yep. He does, you know, he's not a creator. He's not a playmaker. So, and the rest of those guys, these are average or below players, Chris. I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> for, for whatever people loved about Jordan Clarkson in LA and the numbers he put up, I mean, he's, you know, the, the guy can score a little bit. He was but, coming off the bench uh, on a bad team. Yeah. On a bad team. And he's got a lot of bad tendencies and Rodney hood, you know, there's a reason Utah was willing to just like, let him go for nothing because he's a really frustrating and consistent player. He, like these are yeah. not, you know, these are bench players, essentially Larry Nance. I mean, they're, they're fine, but, um, and George Hill's banged up. So this is just not a very good group. If, if the Cavs go down to the first round, the world's going to come apart at the seams and everybody's going to, to, you know, especially other people who already don't like LeBron or are already skeptics of LeBron are going to put it all on him. Fine. I, I guess that's the way the world works, but it, it, it's a, it's a dumb interpretation of what we're seeing. Um, LeBron is still performing at an incredibly high level and every team in the league would kill to have him. And he just doesn't have that much support around him. I still think they'll get out of the first round, but I, you know, I've, I've had skepticism uh, about this team, as I say, all season that they would come out of the East. And, and when asked, I would still lean their way based on LeBron, if nothing else. And because nobody else in the East can, can make that convincing of a case. But, um, you know, our buddy Michael Lee tweeted it earlier, uh, or maybe it was last night, that, that the East is wide open, and I think that that's, that's the case right now, which is a good thing. Would you still pick, I mean, LeBron, I've said that I've picked him just kind of blind face. I think yeah. Philly looks like the best team, but, uh, you know, I, until I see him go down, I'll probably stick with LeBron at least this year. Do you have a feeling on that? Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you give the team with the best player in the NBA the benefit of the doubt. LeBron is still playing yeah. like an MVP. It's hard to bet against him, even though he, he doesn't have the kind of help around him that he really needs to win a championship or, or truly contend. Can he still get out of an Eastern Conference where you've got a Toronto team that doesn't inspire a ton of confidence and a Philly team that's still pretty young, um, you know, Boston, Milwaukee, Washington, all these teams, like, you know, and I'm not predicting, by the way, Milwaukee or, or Washington are going to come out of the first round. I'm just saying, as you look at everybody, every single one of these teams, there's a reason you could, you could try to make a case for them. And, and then there's a thousand caveats behind it. And yeah, Philly looks like the strongest right now, but you know, Hey, we're still middle, middle of the first round. And, you know, things can change rapidly. So, yeah, LeBron gets the benefit of the doubt until we see otherwise. <laughs> so, I, I'm not going to ask you, where's LeBron going? Because, obviously, none of us know. I don't even know if he knows at this. I doubt he knows at this point. Where do you think would be the best fit? And maybe it's Cleveland, I mean, if, if you feel. But where do you think would be the best fit for him next year? So, let's start with a premise. Let's start with the premise that wherever LeBron is signing in July – is the place that he's going to spend the rest of his career, whatever that is, three, four, five, six yeah. years. And that wherever he is, he wants to make sure he can still be in contention every year. That, that he, has a, he has a true shot at contending, if not immediately, then very, very soon thereafter. If that's the case, if I'm LeBron and whenever this Cleveland run ends, 
if you're looking around at that roster, where are you seeing a future on that roster? So I feel like Cleveland, like I'm already ready to like cross them out. Um, if it's based <laughs> on contending now, now if yeah. it's basically just, you know, Hey, be stay home. Uh, you know, don't burn those bridges again. Uh, maybe your family is settled and, and everything. You don't want to leave that area again. Okay. I could see it on that, but if it's about contention, I don't see it in, in Cleveland. Do you, uh, I mean, unless no, that I, Nets, that, unless yeah. that Nets pick wins the lottery, jumps up to one and they can flip it for an all-star because that, that pick, I don't care who it is. That pick ain't helping LeBron James win championships. Um, even if it's number yeah, one. And I don't think but he'll can, get excited about it. You're right. No, no, that, that, that kid's going to need to, to grow up and, and develop just like everybody else who comes out of the draft. Um, and I think so, if that pick, I think if LeBron were to tell Cleveland, I'll stay, you know, for the, the next several years, I think they would trade that pick for it. Yes, yes. But yeah. if that pick stays at eight, then you're not yeah. getting much for it probably. But if that pick gets yeah. to number one, two, three, now you've got a shot to flip it for – somebody who can help you right now, assuming that LeBron says, I'm going to stay and, and play with that guy. Um, but short of that, he's not staying to play with Jordan Clarkson and Tristan Thompson. And like that, I, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, I, I don't know how else they get better. What are the moves they can possibly make? So if it's about contention, I think you start looking elsewhere. Philly becomes really intriguing in that sense. Um, but, we, we, you know, let's play the what if games. You know, we all think that Durant probably doesn't go to the Warriors if not for the fact that the yeah. Warriors lost to Cleveland and now, now there was justification to need him. What if, the, what if the Sixers get to the finals, even if they lost in the finals? The Sixers get to the finals without him. That's not, that would be really weird for LeBron to, like, go jump to the team that's already in the finals. I like, was going to ask like, you that, and I know you're, it's not your style to rip somebody, but I, as you know, a lot of people would just pounce on LeBron. Do you think that <laughs> oh, yeah. would be too <laughs> – would that be too negative of a look for him to go to, you know, the Eastern Conference champion who's right there yeah. on the verge of maybe winning, you know? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting because let's, let's look at that in the light of, of the other moves he's made. When he went to Miami, it was looked at as front-running to an extent because he joined up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh, and then it, nobody had ever done anything like this before, and people flipped out about it. But it's not like the Heat had been a powerhouse until those three got together, right? Like, it had been years since they'd been in the finals. Um, and when he went back to Cleveland, he was joining a team that had been in the lottery every year since he yeah. had left. So yep. he wasn't the, – the idea of being a front-runner, that's, that, and that's the backlash that Durant got, I think – I can't say this definitively, but I think that LeBron has always kind of looked, uh, has, has, has been offended by the idea that, that Durant was doing anything similar to what he did because Durant did go to a team that had been in the finals, whereas LeBron helped build something in Miami and helped build something again in Cleveland. Yeah. And so I, I think, I don't think LeBron wants that look. I don't think he wants to be viewed the way that Durant was viewed as being a front runner and joining essentially a rival. Um, you know, what if the Sixers are the ones to knock the Cavs out in the second round? Like, and then he goes to them, it's going to look like the Durant situation. And I, I don't, yeah. and again, I'm not one who judges Durant on that. I'm, I'm fine with it, but that is how a lot of people viewed it very negatively. So I think, you know, as long as Philly doesn't get to the finals or knock out the Cavs, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like with you on that. That's an option. Yeah. Here's, here's and, the other thing I like, Chris. I, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I see Philly and the Lakers as just two interesting options from a, a narrative perspective. And LeBron's always very aware of, of the storylines that will attach to decisions that he makes and, and, and things that he does, right? So in both cases, he can go to a storied franchise that has gone through a very fallow period. The Sixers, it's no longer fallow. They're in the playoffs. They're, they're, they're good. The Lakers still in a fallow period. But storied franchises in big cities where if he shows up, it's – I'm going to, I'm going to bring these guys back to glory. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up the young pups. I'm going to teach them the, the, the ways of LeBron. I'm going to teach them about work ethic and, yeah. and how to think the game. And I'm going to, I'm going to restore glory. Like the Lakers haven't done anything since Kobe started going into decline and LeBron goes there. He can now be in, in the same, he could be up there with Kobe and Shaq and magic and Kareem and Wilt and everybody and, and be part of that legacy. But, but, but to add to it, because you'd say, well, well, why would you want to follow those guys? Well, because things, things are, are crappy there now. I'm going to be the guy 
who's gonna, yeah. going to help Brandon Ingram and these guys learn and grow into the, the championship team that they can be, and, uh, and I'm going to lead them back. And so I'm going to go down to Laker lore as the guy who restored glory. And it could be the same thing in Philly, although Philly is obviously several steps ahead of the Lakers at this point because of you know Simmons and Embiid. But I can see similar themes attaching to each of those as, and, and that being attractive to him. I mean, bringing that up, and you, as you mentioned earlier, you covered the Lakers for several years uh, as a beat writer. You know that organization. You know the city, the fans. Does If LeBron goes to the Lakers, does he have to win it all? Because I've said that other than Elgin Baylor, every other player with the Lakers of LeBron's ilk, Jerry West, Kobe Bryant, Shaq, Kareem, Magic, you know, uh, they all deliver championships. Do, and, and the Lakers don't get excited about a second-round appearance. Um, you know, our Western Conference <laughs> yeah. Finals appears. So do you feel he would have to deliver a championship there? And if he didn't, would that be kind of a, a, a mark on his leg, a negative mark on his legacy or, or not? He gets a little bit of breathing room on this, Chris. Um, but although I, we should throw in one other factor here. Because I don't think he's going to L.A. unless Paul George or somebody like that is going with him. Yeah, like he knows he can't, he can't. He can't win it on his own. Like going and I mean, maybe he'd be slightly better off with Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram and those guys than what he's got in Cleveland. Maybe, but he's also going to then be in the Warriors he's conference, in the, West, in the Rockets yeah. conference. He's in the West. It's a lot harder. But I, I tend to think that he's not making a move to a place like the Lakers without another established star coming with him. And I think Paul George is certainly in play, and 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 that that combination with the young guys. Plus, then they become an attractive destination for other veterans who are like, you know what, I'm going to go chase a ring and take less money. Like, you could see them building up that roster quickly around those guys if they made that commitment together. So then to your question about do you have to win a championship, yes and no. I mean, yeah, that's the only way they judge anything in L.A. It's always championship or bust, first, second round appearances. They don't, like, they don't hang division banners at Staples Center, you know? <laughs> um, yeah that, that, you know, that, that, that's the, that's a Sacramento thing. Um, but I, I, I do agree that the standard there is very high for what's considered to be success. However, we, we, we are looking at LeBron going into year 16. And I think that he's now, if he goes to say LA, he's going there as kind of older Kareem where Paul George and, Ingram and Ball, those guys eventually become like the Magic Johnson role of being the, the more of the engine while LeBron can play, I don't want to say secondary, I don't know how he's ever secondary, but in the near term, he's still primary. But we're not, it's not that far off. Eventually, like, he is human, yeah, so, I think. Yeah. <laughs> like, at some point, at some point, and that's, to me, that's the other consideration that people haven't thought enough or talked enough about, which is wherever he goes next, Yes, titles are important. Contention is important. Uh, personal and professional happiness, all those things are important. It, but it also should be somewhere where, as he moves into his mid to late 30s, he's 33 now. When he's 36, 37, if he's still playing, can, does he, he can't continue to, to handle as much of the load as he does now. So somebody else on that roster has to be growing into that role, and he becomes, like I say, more of the Kareem to Magic, where... Yeah. He is the elder statesman who can still do a lot of damage, but he doesn't have to, to carry as heavy a load anymore. So I think that's a huge part of this. And because of that, to get back to your question, I think it alleviates a little bit of the title demands because it won't always be in his hands. It's going to start to become somebody else's responsibility with him. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great point. Um, you, you mentioned Golden State earlier. Do you think they still are the team that gets out of the West ultimately this year? Or can they be pushed, you know, by New Orleans, which is, you know, obviously had a great first round sweep against Portland. Yeah. I wish we knew what Steph Curry was going to look like, right? Yeah. Because if, if we could assume a fully healthy, you know, peak level Steph Curry from game one of the second round, then I'm like, it's the Warriors still, no question. No, no question. The Pelicans are great. They're going to push them. They're going to make it hard. Um, they have earned our respect. They have earned the Warriors' respect. But it's definitely the Warriors. But, but we can't say that right now. Um, you know, Curry's going to be reevaluated later in the week. Maybe he plays game one. Maybe he doesn't play till game two, for all we know. 
And we don't know what he'll look like when he gets back out there. Is he a hundred percent or is this like a, uh, is this going to be like a couple of years ago where he's never quite right again for the rest of the postseason? Um, then they become a little more vulnerable. Now the, the Warriors still have more talent. They obviously have more experience at this level. Um, they've been together longer. There's still a lot going in their favor. And I'll, I, I'll, I'll still say that they're going to win that series, but if Curry's a little diminished, um, you know, the, the challenge becomes steeper because stopping Anthony Davis, I don't know if that, that's probably not possible. So what you're going to need then is to just have the firepower where it doesn't matter. And to have the full firepower, you got to have Curry out there with Durant and the rest. So um, I, I think the Pelicans. So if he, if Curry, if he play, let's say he misses the first two, I'm just obviously speculating. If he misses the first two games of the series, then comes back at, you know, 85, 90% playing well, but maybe not quite at his optimum level. Do you actually think New Orleans could beat them? I think it's possible. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to say that they I – mean, I certainly wouldn't predict it. But if we're talking Curry missing the first two games and coming back diminished for game three through whatever, I, that's really I – th- I think that's pretty scary. Um, yeah. I mean, the Pelicans are legitimately good now. Um, they're still weird. It's still kind of a strange group. <laughs> um, but it's much more logical group than it was when, it's, when they started the season. Like, they're better off I, – I know, I'm going to get killed. They are better off without DeMarcus Cousins. There's a, it's, it's better I, to have, I agree. It, yeah, they, they, you know exactly what you are about. Your identity is about Anthony Davis and, to an extent, about Drew Holiday, and everybody else fills their roles around them. Now, they could use more shooting. They could use more wing de- defenders. They could use more depth. Um, there's a lot they could use, but and they have a more logical lineup, especially for today's NBA with Anthony Davis as your undisputed number one option, your undisputed center with a stretch four uh, in Miritich next to him. Yeah. Like, this is a more logical roster than what they had to open the season. And I think they're truly dangerous. And, um, and Alvin Gentry knows that, knows that Warriors team well, so they're, they're going to be prepared. Yeah. And I, I'm with you on cousins. Um, look, I know it doesn't really happen much in today's NBA, and I obviously puts up huge numbers. But I would say you're a small market team where money matters. You can't just spin yeah. through the roof. So that's another thing that I think they're a better team without him, as good as he is individually. I just for all the reasons you said, and I mean, why would I pay that? If I pay that huge money to him. I mean, my, my, I'm through the luxury tax because Drew Holiday is making big money. Obviously, Anthony Davis. Um, I mean, I'm, do you think they would have the guts, though? Because a lot of teams just won't let a guy like that go. I, most of what I'm hearing now, although it could change, is that it looks like they'd bring him back. But what, what are your feelings on that? Um, my feelings are that, that DeMarcus Cousins is a risk. Um, he was a risk even when he was healthy because of his, his, just his volatility, his track record. But he's a bigger risk now because Achilles injuries are no joke. Um, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, not, it's not a pretty list of people who have tried to come back from these things. And he's, he's later in his career. You know, he's still in his prime in theory, but, you know, prime, prime varies from player to player depending on your health. And right now, He's got a very serious injury to overcome. He's also, he's a big guy and he's not one who's ever been viewed as uh, particularly diligent about his workouts. Um, so yeah. that he may gain, he's, he's almost certainly gaining weight while he's recovering. Um, I just, I think there's a lot of risk there and I, you know, put it this way. If the question is, would you keep him if it took giving him a max deal? I'd say absolutely not. There's no way I'm giving the max deal. The only way I'm bringing him back is at some sort of, of lesser number that minimizes my risk. Um, and even then I'd be uncomfortable um, <laughs> because they're playing so well without him. And he does look, he, he's got a track record. He's, he's been a yeah. tough haul for, for teams to deal with. And, you know, that money. Now you and I both know the salary cap is complicated. And just because you don't spend 150 on, 150 million on DeMarcus Cousins doesn't mean you automatically have that available to spread around other players because yeah. the cap doesn't work that way. However, you can't tie up all that money knowing that you do have all these other needs and that if you've got a roster that's really working well, that's made it to the second round for the first time with Anthony Davis, that um, 
that has nice pieces there. Now what I'm look, thinking is, what's the best use of my resources within the, the constraints of the cap to get myself a point guard? Because Rajon Rondo is eventually going to age out. Um, I don't know how long he's sticking around, but I'm going to need a point yeah. guard of the future. If, if Drew Holiday is now essentially kind of like a ball handling off guard, um, I'm going to need more shooting. I'm going to need, you know, as I said, you know, perimeter defenders. There are other needs I would rather um, take care of with that money. Yeah, no, I'm with you. The team they beat, Portland, uh, is it time to blow up that backcourt? It's, to some people, it's reminiscent of Steph Curry and Monte Ellis. And remember that Monte Ellis trade at the time was not popular when they split no. up those two. Uh, do you see the same thing being necessary in Portland? Yeah, the only, the only problem I have with that uh, analogy is that uh, – Whoever is Monte Ellis in this analogy is way better than Monte Ellis. <laughs> like Mon- Mon- Monte Ellis uh, got the benefit of being like a, a fun to watch high scoring warrior at a time when the Warriors had been crappy for so long that fans just like it didn't they they, they were gonna to you know be uh, they're gonna they were gonna do embrace and uh, elevate him yeah. regardless. He had his 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 stature in the Bay Area was a little bit beyond or a lot beyond what he actually uh, merited, I think. So uh, I think C.J. McCollum, if, 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 if McCollum is, is the uh, Monte in this analogy, he's way better than Monte. Um, but anyway, I think the, the Trailblazers have, have painted themselves into a corner. Um, obviously, a lot of those big contracts they gave out in 2016 are coming back to haunt them. The Nurkic deal, which looked good in the short term, it still is fine. It's not hurting them. And he's a free agent yeah. so he can walk. But I mean, he's not, he's not that piece they were missing. Like what they wanted was if we can find that front court piece to balance out, you know, our, our all-star ish backcourt, then we're good. But uh, they just, they just don't have anybody they can rely on outside of the two guards. And so if you're locked up cap wise, which they are, if you don't have anybody immediately emerging in the front court and we'll see about Collins, but it, it could be a while. I, I think you have to seriously, entertain it. I, I think that, you know, you've got to find another way forward. And I don't know, there's just not that much flexibility um, given their cap situation. Um, if you just roll it back with the same group next year, still built around McCollum and Lillard, you can expect probably the same result. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. I, well, before we go, uh, you retweeted something, uh, I think it was Monday morning, uh, this morning. Um, saying that basketball Twitter is getting less fun every day and wonder why it has to be so toxic. Uh, um, tell me kind of what your feelings are on that, and, and does that weigh on you, you know, you being a high-profile and active basketball Twitter personality? As, as are you, my friend. Um, <laughs> and you probably get a lot more backlash. <laughs> you get a lot more backlash than I do yeah, because you're a TV yeah. guy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Tom Ziller, who writes uh, for SB Nation, who's, who's excellent at his job, and, and Tom Ziller has always been a very you know, thoughtful basketball mind, um, whether he's writing for SB Nation or whether he's tweeting. Um, he's always got interesting things to say, and it was, it was Ziller who posted, or it was part of his, his uh, roundup this morning that basically he was explaining why he's no longer on Twitter. He's going on Twitter to tweet out his links to his material, but he's not engaging on Twitter anymore. He's not having the conversation anymore because yeah. he feels that things have gotten too toxic. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think we've all felt that at times. Um, and I used to be much more active in trying to respond to people in my mentions on Twitter. I now am very selective about it. And if people are just being belligerent or just, you know, uh, you know, being jerks for the sake of being jerks or just trying to provoke me or trolling or whatever, I'm very uh, generous with the block and the mute keys these days. Like, I don't care. I don't care what my <laughs> follower count is. I don't care if I'm losing people. Yeah. Um, obviously, from a lot of what I've done in terms of, of, of politics that I'm retweeting, I don't care who I'm alienating at this point. I just, yeah. I, I, gotta, I gotta do what makes sense to me. And if people are coming to my mentions just to have a fight or just to scream or hurl insults, I don't need it. Uh, so I block or I mute and I don't respond very often. Occasionally, you know, I had a bunch of Pacers fans coming after me a couple of weeks ago because of a video I did in which I referred to the Pacers as uninspiring. Um, it, it, it wasn't uninspiring as a group. It was uninspiring as a contender for the East crowd. I was putting them in contrast to 
the Sixers, um, among choices that you could pick to come out of the East. But that word really, really pissed off a lot of Pacer fans. So that Pacer <laughs> fans coming at me, and because enough of them did with the same complaint, I thought I should at least respond. I found the one guy who was actually being civil, and I responded to him <laughs> and said, thank you for being civil. Here's why I use that word. Here's what I was referring to. Here's what the context was. I'm not sure why people are so out of, been out of shape, but okay. And in doing so, I hoped that the rest of them would see the response to that guy and that would just take care of it. But all the ones who were being belligerent, I either muted or blocked. Um, I don't know what Ziller, what specific thing. I'd be curious to know what's, if it was a specific exchange or a series of exchanges or what it was that finally drove him to say he's just not going to do it anymore. Um, I've never reached that point. I, I, I've, there have been plenty of times where I feel like Twitter is just a, a freaking cesspool and you know it's, it's <laughs> dragging us all down. But you can regulate that yourself. You can choose not to yeah. respond. You can choose to block and mute. You can choose how much to use it. Um, but, yeah, there are, there are times it's a little depressing uh, to see what's on there. I, know, I got one more question before you go, uh, and it's kind of yeah. back to basketball. Before, if, if, if I were to tell you Golden State does not reach the finals, who would your and, and I'm gonna I'll just do it in the East too. If I were to tell you Golden State and Cleveland don't reach the finals, who would your picks be? Who who would you think would reach it? I mean, I, I really have a hard time believing it's anybody other than the Warriors or Rockets. So if it's not the Warriors, I'm going with the Rockets. I just don't think anybody else is even close to their level. And, you know, as fun as intriguing as the Pelicans are, that would be an awfully big leap for a team that hadn't even been in the playoffs for a few years. Yeah. Um, and yeah. normally, normally I would, I would apply that same principle to the Sixers that for a team that hasn't been in the playoffs in years to make a leap from lottery to finals is huge, but the East doesn't have a team like the Rockets or the Warriors. The East doesn't have anybody that you just yeah. look at and say, well, you're never get you're never getting past team X. Um, if it's not, so if it's not the Warriors, it's the Rockets. If it's not the Cavs, Man, <laughs> it's, it's wide it's open. Tough. There's no question. It's yeah. like, it's like, look, Toronto fans, you know, this is a, another fan base that that's always got a chip on their shoulder. They feel like they don't get respect and people don't, don't give the Raptors their due. It's hard for anybody to buy. I think even for a lot of Raptors fans, it's hard to have faith in the Raptors. <laughs> we've seen so many flame outs. So we've seen it even in this series where they start to yeah. get a little bit wobbly and, um, you know, and I, and it, I hate to say, sound like the bandwagon hopper, but like, man, the Sixers are really, really good. <laughs> and they've got yep, two yep. guys who, who could be MVP caliber players year in, year out for the next 10 years. And while, it is, while they're young at the two most important spots, you know, their two best players are the, are the young ones, they do have some vets around them. They, they do have J.J. Redick and Amir Johnson and, and Ilyasova and Bellinelli. Um, they got some guys who have been around and they've got a really good coach in Brett Brown who doesn't yep. get nearly enough credit. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to, to make that leap, but all right, for the sake of argument. Yeah. I'll go Sixers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard, my man, thank you. Uh, you were great as always. I appreciate the insight and um, I will see you. I'm sure I'll see you somewhere. It may not be till the finals, but I'll see you out there on the road somewhere. No, absolutely. Definitely see you somewhere along the, along the way here. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll be hanging out in Philly and Houston. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I would agree with your picks, too. If it's not Golden State and Cleveland, I would agree with Houston and Philadelphia. So, we'll see. Hey, I'll, All right, I'll, my I'll, man. I'll, I'll leave it on. I was just going to say, I'll leave it on this note. At least we're, there's a conversation to have. At least there's some mystery, which we didn't have for the last couple of years, right? So, that's a plus. No, I, I agree. And, and I've said, I don't know if you agree, to me, this is the first time since 2011 when Derrick Rose, you know, had his career-changing injury in Chicago that if LeBron doesn't make it to the finals, there's kind of that intriguing team in the East. Like, if Philadelphia makes it, I don't think people would be quite as into it as if LeBron made it, but I think they would captivate the fans nationwide because they're now this young up-and-coming team this guy that people compare to Magic Johnson and Ben Simmons and Embiid, arguably the best big man in the league. I don't think we've had a, a viable option in terms of being a captivating team other than LeBron in, you know, six, seven years in the East. 
Absolutely. Agreed. And I think that that is, that is why so many people are so eager to jump on the bandwagon because it's not just that they're all of a sudden good. It's that they're fun. They're intriguing. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. But like I say, whoever makes it, even if it's the Cavs again, the fact that we can even have a reasonable conversation that there is some question, some mystery about it is good for the NBA because the, that feeling of inevitability the last couple of years was, yeah. uh, you know, a little, a little bit of a downer. It's more fun to, to, to have a, a real, debate and see how it develops no question no question all right my man again great job and i'll see you down the road appreciate it chris thanks for having me take care all right howard yep later